The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, <clears throat> How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the word proclaimed through the prophets and in these last days shown to us by your Son. We thank you for his proclamation, but especially for his work on our behalf. We pray that you would bless us with your spirit now. Open up our hearts and minds so that through your word we know your will and through your spirit have strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know if you uh, actually got where the uh, pastor was going with the 82 days. Anybody else know that was Christmas? Did you really? Yeah, I had no idea. Uh, two homilies ago I did, but uh, um, that, was, uh, that was kind of in the past. I don't remember that. But I do remember eating um, uh, dinner uh, with my family about 25 years ago. I remember it um, because it was distinctive enough. It struck me that I was making progress as a parent. Do we not always look for that, right? <laughs> my uh, phone rang, and my daughter Joy was sitting across the table. And when it rang, she jumped up out of her seat, passed her sister, um, and uh, grabbed the phone. We couldn't hear what was said, but we could fill in the blanks that somebody was asking if Joy was there. Is Joy there? Now, Joy responded, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you <clears throat> excuse me, multiple choice as to what she might have said. Number one, this is her. Two, this is she. Three, you got her. Four, yo, what's up? Any votes on which of those Joy answered? Ten years old that she was from New York? Three. Three. Four. Three. Two. Two is the correct answer. Two is the correct way you need to answer the phone. Mrs. Grant will turn over in her grave, my sixth grade teacher. In those days, it was a few years ago, they actually could charge you, and Mrs. Brandt did. If we got a predicate nominative wrong in, on a test, it cost a nickel. 
And she put them in a Hellman's mayonnaise jar, you know, the big ones. And at the end of the year, we had a party on all the nickels she got from predicate nominatives and subjunctive contrary to fact. You would, of course, sixth grade. I never learned another bit of English after sixth grade. I didn't have to. Honestly, um, if you were going to say about being a king, if I were a king or if I was a king, correct is? Were. were because that's contrary to fact. It's subjunctive case. Uh, it's a terrible burden to carry. Nonetheless, <laughs> the problem for my kids is that when they spoke incorrect English, I would tweak them. Just a minor, gentle as it could be, but to help them. And they didn't have to learn the rules. They just had to learn to talk correctly. Well, in the lessons for today, I really sense that there, there's some tweaking going on and that it really reflects what most people see discipleship as, just a little tweak. And then there's some other parts of the lessons that are kind of a do-over, <clears throat> that you want to kind of uh, do this thing again. And then there's the third part, and that is where you really start fresh. <clears throat> you start over and, and begin from scratch. Now, when I get uh, materials from the staff, they'll pass it by my desk. We pass it by a lot of desks, try to make sure we have the right date, the time, everything is correct in it. And they pass it to me. And once I've looked at it, and I, I change the color to red, anything I've uh, uh, altered slightly, and I send it back to whoever sent it to me. And you know what the subject line is? Tweet. Tweet. If there are no changes at all, it just goes back to them, or I say, good job, uh, or I send it back, tweet, uh, T-W-E-A-K-E-D, tweet, just a slight tweak, and I put it in red so that they can find it throughout it. Sometimes they give me the material, and it's, it's more than a tweak. It's got to have some major changes. Maybe there's a paragraph that applied to something in the past I cross out, uh, something that they forgot and I added in, and there's some really kind of some major changes, and then... Once in a while, I have a letter to send you, and graciously, uh, our gifted staff will send me copies of previous years, and sometimes I read those and say, my God, and I start from scratch. There's the three ways. Number one, tweaking. I think tweaking is the way most people, very honestly, see discipleship when they are invited to follow Jesus. Uh, a few tweaks to my life that I basically am a nice person. I think that's the way we feel. And relative to what we read in the papers or see on TV, we are. There are some really bad people out there, and mostly we're not that way. We may think it, but we don't do it. And so, so when Jesus comes, he comes as an advisor, a counselor, or a, as the lesson said, Nicodemus called him, rabbi, teacher. So I want a little input. Huh? You know, I'm struggling with my life. What should I do? And we hear scripture, and it says, you know, you ought to remember the Sabbath day, a day of rest. And, and there are times, you know, we'll send little notes to people. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Well, I'm taking up the Bible. You know, he said I should rest, so I'm sleeping in on Sundays. <laughs> Not exactly what he meant, but, but it's a tweak to life. I'm exhausted, so some rest would be good. A little bit of tweaking. Jesus is simply, in this case, uh, a, uh, a teacher, a rabbi. Now, I, I don't know if you picked it up, but I'll give you 53 points if you can tell me the one channel people could watch on TV in, in those days from the gospel lesson. Yes, sir. What channel? Um. Tough question. Anybody else pick it up? Nick at night? Did, did nobody else pick that? <laughs> All right, Nicodemus comes at night. You have to pay attention to these things. I mean, the papyrus is very expensive. Nobody just throws in and extra sentences unless they're significant. And Nicodemus comes at night. Why? Because he doesn't want much change in his life. He has seen Jesus do a miracle, a sign. Uh, in this gospel, we're only at chapter 3, and in chapter 2, it happened. Anybody remember what that was? I'll give you another 53 points. I'm in a good mood, you know. Hoping to encourage you to stay to help. Uh, anyway, go ahead. What's the one first sign, John says, that Jesus did that indicates he's more than a rabbi? I'm trying to give you a hint. 
That's that's the wedding reception. That's yes. The water into wine. Yes, they ran out of wine. Stay with me. For, is, is it hot in here? It's warm. I, it's warm. Turn on the air conditioner. They're dozing off. I you were, Pastor, really, you know where that is over there? Just hit somebody. Turn it down. Please. That's right. I'm, I'm losing them already. I hardly started. My God. Okay. Anyway, Nicodemus um, doesn't want any major changes. What's his job? What does he do? He's a ruler in the council. He is probably on the Sanhedrin. So he comes to Jesus for some spiritual advice. What can I do? We've got to make decisions about what to do with Rome and what laws we are to obey or not obey. Uh, and it's, uh, we want to make sure it doesn't cost too much to be a disciple of Jesus. The idea that it would, would actually take something. I actually I find it interesting amusing, um, concerning, that sometimes, if, if you're going to join, if you're not a member, let me mention, you're invited to an orientation. And what I do is try to describe the mission and ministry of this place. Can you imagine how long that would take, those of you who have been around? So I try to keep it as short as I can, and I describe how God has blessed us, and people use their gifts, and it's tremendous, and it's fun, and it's exciting. What I find amusing is the number of people who go through orientation and don't join. <laughs> honestly, honestly, they, they look at that and say, well, man, if that's what it takes, I don't want to be part of that group, um, and that's okay. But it needs to be said up front that Jesus really has more in mind than a little bit of tweaking of our lives, an occasional you know, uh, Christmas and Easter touching base with God. There is a second um, uh, kind of uh, level uh, that people understand this to be, and that would be called the do-over. I would call it that. You know about do-overs, you remember? Are you too far from childhood? You remember, I don't know who wrote the rule, but when you play checkers, officially, as long as your hand is not off that checker, you could do it over, right? And so you kind of watch the other person to see if they flinch, if they're going, yes! You know, you go, no, and you move it back. <laughs> you do it over. You want a chance to have a second try at it. And, uh, you know, that's what Jesus seems to be describing in Nicodemus's mind. You have to be born anew, born again. Well, that's not a Lutheran phrase, but Jesus kind of used it. Uh, born again, I'm going to do this. And Nicodemus rightly asks the question, how in the world can that happen? I am an old fogey. It's in the text. Anyway, I'm just as, am I going to re-enter my mother's womb? It's too late for me. As a teacher, maybe you can give me insights. I can help the next generation. But it is really too late for me. Jesus explains, this is not at all what's possible. Flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. So even if you got a chance to go back and do your life over, I don't know if you've ever had that as a creative writing course, if I could do it again, did anybody else have that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, how do you think it would come out? I mean, as good as Groundhog Day. I mean, really, Bill Murray, we just get, we'd be improving all along and maybe six or eight times. I mean, there are those religions that suggest that reincarnation, you know, you're either becoming a frog or a prince next time based on what you're doing now. Would we ever at a certain point be able to disconnect from our bondage to sin? What Jesus describes is that that is not going to work. It cannot be simply a matter of redoing our lives. And I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I do some study of the words of Scripture, and um, it, it's not a particularly good translation. It leaves out what the sense of it is. Jesus says, not born again. To any of your born-again friends, you should mention that it doesn't actually say that. What it, it doesn't even really say born anew. It says born from on high. And there's a difference, especially when Jesus is talking about the Spirit and when he's talking about the fact that no one has ascended into heaven, only the Son of Man who descended. I was there. I am going to bring you something more than just redoing your life. The young man who comes to Jesus and says, uh, I want you to help me. Uh, um, Jesus becomes this kind of servant to us. Uh, my brother won't share the inheritance. Can you make him do that? Can you make our lives uh, a little bit better? Now, this is more serious, and some people hear the words of Jesus, like, um, uh, if you would be my disciple, what do you do? Three things. 
pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Okay, that's, is that hyperbole? Uh, is he using kind of an example to extreme? I mean, I wouldn't really like deny ourselves. How is that even possible? How would life be lived out by us if we were born from above? And that's the third one, the one that Jesus said he came to bring. Not to tweak things, uh, not to take the easy road. I must go to the cross and die, even though Peter says that wouldn't be necessary. Jesus describes something else, and that is to be born from above. A new life altogether. Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, there will be no hope. We are in bondage to sin, and just redoing our fleshy lives will not change anything. But he says to his disciples, there is another possibility. It's a life that I can give you. So born from water and the Spirit. Any water ideas you might have, what Jesus might have had in mind? Rebirth? Born again? Let me see, the phrase would be, obviously you got it to it too soon, I was going to I was gonna give another hint to try to help him out here. Um, you know, in the liturgy, it says, um, I was born child of a fallen humanity, but in baptism, I am reborn, born from on high, a child of God. That's what God does in baptism, claims us. How do we pray, Jesus? Pray like this, Father... A new family that is created as we are baptized into Christ. I find it a, a particularly strange thing. Two really strange things that happened after Jesus left. Now, there are lots, but these two in particular. Number one, that we have the meal. That strikes me as odd. As far as we can tell, Jesus had the Passover several times with his disciples, but never instituted the Lord's Supper the sacrament of the altar, the Eucharist, communion. Not until the night in which he was betrayed. It's almost last minute. I mean, with so many things going on, would the disciples even remember it? Would they be looking and remembering what Jesus said that night? Do this in remembrance of me. And the fact that disciples started to eat that meal when they had never eaten it before, they had no creeds. They had no confession they could make to the world. But instead, they gathered around the meal. And there was something new that happened. They broke every barrier. Soldiers and slaves and uh, slave owners and men, uh, uh, children and men and women all gathered around the meal. And Paul says, as often as we eat of this meal, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the whole liturgical response came up around that. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Those early liturgies were the confession of the church of what happened when someone was baptized into Christ Jesus. Paul summarizes it. When we were baptized, we were baptized into Christ's death. So we are in him. And as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we therefore might lead a new life. Some of our uh, denominational brothers and sisters um, really focus on the day of decision. You know, have you been saved? Can you remember the day, when, the before and the after of your discipleship? For us as Lutherans, uh, we're, we're just too greedy. We're not going to limit that to one day. We're going to have today is the day where we remember our baptism, Luther says, where we daily drown the old Adam in order that a new person come forth who was born from above, who was given the spirit. These, oh, I, I said there were two. One was the meal and the other was baptism. The disciples did not do a lot. Uh, we don't have a lot of record of their doing lots of baptisms. They did baptize. But the baptism changed from John the Baptist's baptism of repentance, preparing the way of the Lord, to the tool that brought about Matthew 28, go and make disciples, baptizing them. And they did it from the beginning. They were called to new life through the water and the word. 
Luther asked the question, how can water do that? What kind of special water? Do we have to keep doing it in the Jordan? No, it's water with the word. And the word of God will not return empty. And so in that water of baptism, we received the powerful spirit of God. The one that Jesus said needed to come. We'd like to have you stay with us. You don't need to leave. If I don't leave, you can't have the spirit. And until you get the power from on high, you cannot be my witnesses. What are the odds of the early church getting out of the first century? They've got no evangelism program that they have figured out. They've got the Jews hating them. They've got the Romans seeking them. Uh, they've got their family that have disowned them. And there are uh, this small group of people confused who let Jesus die on the cross and then he disappears. Story told that he ascended into a cloud and, and it took him out of their sight. But one way or the other, he's not there. How does it get out of the first century? How can those disciples believe? I believe we can't believe. Who recognizes that? Third article of the Creed, Luther's explanation, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe. I believe I can't believe. But the Holy Spirit creates within us this faith, this trust in God, this new life, where now we recognize that our lives are in his hands. No one will snatch you from my hand. If you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you will live forever. This new life that Christ gives us, where he lives in us and we live in him, is the life that is eternal. The rest is passing away. We're dust, and our fleshly bodies are going to return to dust. But the life we have in Christ as a life of joy and peace, of witness and love, of forgiveness that keeps flowing to us. And we rejoice and give thanks for that gift and then live our lives in thanksgiving. Offer yourselves, Paul says to the Romans, as a living sacrifice. They're not going back to the temple anymore. All the laws required, they ignored because they believed they were to be the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, that what they were doing in the world was worship. Their liturgy, their work was out there in the world. So I don't know what plan you had coming, and I don't know about the habits you've got in terms of worship, but I want to share with you that God's got a plan. He wants something new for you. <coughs> Not getting ahead in the world, but living a new life that his spirit has given you. And as we gather around word and sacrament, he is strengthening us in faith. He is giving us eyes to see the needs of those around us, the prayers that can be lifted up on behalf of others, and to use the gifts that the spirit has given us to serve in his name in the world and in this community. Pray the Lord would bless you in your new life, a grace-filled life, a forgiven life, a life filled with his love. And I pray for all of us that that would flow from us readily in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.